Good morning. I've been uh, very discouraged lately about uh, the lack of response to my work. We're talking years and years of work, especially if you start back in 1997 when I started working on my documentary, In Another Life, Reincarnation in America. And then the last 11 years that I've been working on uh, this question of my past life in the 19th century is Matthew Franklin Whittier. I mean, I've approached the ap academics, I've approached the uh, New Age people, I've approached the uh, avant-garde and consciousness studies, I've done podcasts, I've done blogs, um, reporters I've approached, and the response is quite minimal, as you can see in the stats, you know. But uh, I go through a period of being discouraged, and then I get defiant, and I say, the heck with it, you know, I just continue. So today, what I'm going to do is get into the carpet bag. This is volume one of the carpet bag, as I've shown you many times before. This is very rare. You can't, you can, you can't even hardly get hold of a single edition of that thing, no less the first volume. I was just very fortunate. Um, and uh, Matthew has a very strong presence in this newspaper. What I'm going to do is just kind of be very informal here. Um, you know, I'm always nervous in front of the camera, as you can probably tell. I'm just going to try to relax and just, I've got my old raggedy shirt on here, and I'm going to stop worrying about who likes my work and who doesn't and who believes me and who doesn't. I haven't been able to figure out whether people uh, shy away from me because they don't believe me. That's always been my assumption. They just never entertain the slightest possibility that what I'm presenting could be real, you know. And part of that is because uh, there's so many people operating on imagination out there that after a while, people just don't really believe anything, you know. So maybe that's the way they approach me. They don't believe me any more than they believe any of the other people, even though I have the evidence that I've been really rigorous in what I've been doing. Or they're afraid of it, which is also possible. That's what I feel like Abby tells me, that uh, people are afraid. And then they tell themselves anything, but deep down, they're just scared of it. Well, I don't know. And at, at this point, I don't care. So what I'm going to do is explore a little series. And I'm going to go into the depth of it. I'm going to try to give as much background as I can in this case, as opposed to just kind of briefly touching on the background. This time, I'm really going to sit down and look at it and explain. And the reason I want to do that is because I want people now or in the future, or maybe never, to get to know Matthew personally, because to me, when I read A Christmas Carol, I know Matthew and I know Abby, at least the historical Abby I'm talking about, so well that it's obvious. It's just, it's just in your face obvious that they were the original authors and that Dickens couldn't possibly be. And yet it's not obvious to anybody else. And I think the main reason is they don't know Abby and Matthew like I know them. See, So I want people to get to know them. And the same thing goes for The Raven. It's obvious that Matthew wrote that poem. You know, not just, this isn't just speculation. I mean, I do have the evidence, but I shouldn't need the evidence. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Because if you knew Matthew Franklin Whittier, I mean, I know him from the inside because I was him. But even if you just got to know him as a person, and there's so many pieces, I have 2,300 plus of his pieces digitized, you know, and that'll be available to people in the future if my work survives me. It's just in your face obvious that he was the author. So let's get to know Matthew in this series. Now, the first thing to know about him is that he was a reporter as a, you know, extra bread and butter income. He was a reporter. And like all reporters, he had to do some pretty mundane stuff. One of the things he did, I just recently talked about, was the blotter or the arraignment hearings at the police office. He did that in 1835 for the New York Transcript. And he also did that again when he was undercover as an abolitionist in New Orleans in 1846, where he signed his F for the uh, Daily Delta. And then again the next year where he didn't sign. And there was one other reporter, so it's a little tricky figuring out which is which, especially toward the end. And then he did a brief stint, I think, in 1848. I think he got caught or got 
outed and left. <laughs> you know, that's that's a whole different story. We're not going to go into. But uh, in addition to the blotter, one of the mundane jobs on the paper that he did was to uh, report on meetings. He also did speeches and reviews of talks, but that's all. That again is a whole other topic. But apparently, he did a lot of meetings, and they were very boring. And Matthew, being a humorist, would uh, tend to make fun of them. So in the carpet bag, on three different occasions, he writes a parody of these meetings. These are agricultural meetings. Now, you can't imagine. He, he was raised a farmer, so he knew the subject very well. Probably one reason he got the job. But you can't imagine anything more boring than Robert's rules of order applied to farmers' concerns, you know. So he parodied these things, and he loved puns. So what he did was to take the subject of the meeting as a pun, and then he would go through the entire meeting making puns on, on this particular topic. So the first one appears in the third edition of the carpet bag. Now remember, he had a very heavy presence in this in this paper, he had a, a heavy financial interest in it, although he's not listed in the history. There is a brief mention that he was that the editor uh, and the head of the paper, Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber, is quoted as saying that he was among the people who I don't I forget how he put it now. It's slipping my mind. But he was one of the people who suffered as a result of the demise of the carpet bag, meaning he had a heavy financial interest in it. He also was heavily involved in the editing, which is he wasn't officially one of the associate editors, but he was unofficially one of the associate editors because he had a heavy investment in the paper. And he contributed, as I've determined, as many as eight pieces per weekly edition. So he wrote like crazy for this thing under all different pseudonyms. So he basically split himself into like eight different characters or writers and submitted them and, and, and kind of built the paper from the beginning. And it was his humor which set the tone for this paper every bit as much as Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber's. This is blasphemy. You know, this is heresy. But it's the truth. So uh, that gives you a little bit of the background. Now, Schillaber did not always know who these characters were. He knew his core writers, but he didn't know which pieces they were submitting necessarily. And we know that from the two correspondence column. Every newspaper had its two correspondence column where the editor would write to the people who were submitting or to other other readers, sometimes little personal messages. He would say why he rejected something. Sometimes he was sarcastic, depending on the editor. So in the two correspondence column of this paper, Benjamin Penhallow Schillaber makes pretty clear that he doesn't always know who's submitting these pieces. See? So we don't know how many of these Schillaber actually knew were Matthews. Well, anyway, some of these were signed, some were not. I've just indicated that the entire series, Trismegistus, was not, as Schillaber indicated in his memoirs, written by Benjamin Drew. It was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. Been through that before, last couple entries. This one is anonymous. I'm going to bring this down low enough to where I can read. Maybe I won't make too many mistakes. In the third edition of April 19, 1851, it's called Legislative Agricultural Society, and I can't read Roman numerals. This is XC1X, so I don't know how many meetings this is supposed to be, but the gist of it is this is a whole bunch of meetings that Matthew has had to attend and report on. I don't think it's relevant. It's just meant to indicate that He'd been to an awful lot of meetings, and they were getting so boring, he was having to create parodies of them. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, and it's going to take me time to kind of find little excerpts. It's full of puns. It's full of 19th century references. The whole thing is chock full of, you know, jokes, right? So some of these I understand, some of them I don't. The subject here, well, I'll just read it. The Honorable William... B-A-R-E-A-C-R-E-S, Barkers, in the chair, subject for discussion, wild oats. 
Now, I don't know if in the 19th century sowing wild oats always meant fornicating as it does now, or if it meant just being wild, you know, having a wild night on the town and being a, a loose character, you know. It's probably a little bit of both. Apparently, it might not have specifically meant sex back in the day, so that's something to keep in mind. So, uh, let's see, starts out, Mr. Green of Berkshire said, that it would be recollected that at the last meeting of the society he had stated it to be his intention, I think Matthew's purposely writing in a kind of a stuffy style, to communicate an interesting discovery he had made of the highest importance to the agricultural world. It had been his good fortune since the commencement of the present session of the legislature to associate very freely with several of the Boston members and he would take this occasion to say that they were good fellows who had the interest of the whole community at heart and fair representatives of their constituents. But what he most admired in the Bostonians was their love of knowledge and particularly their pursuit of agricultural knowledge under difficulties. There's a lot of phrases in here that I recognize as Matthews. He had, under difficulties is one, he had learned with sensations of lively satisfaction which he should find it very difficult to clothe with language, that the youth of Boston were so zealously attached to agricultural science, so desirous of evincing their regard for the first and greatest and most numerously followed of all human pursuits, and so ready with a beautiful consistency that cannot be too highly praised to reduce their theory to practice, that they were almost universally engaged in sowing wild oats. So you get the gist of this. He's he's adopting the stuffy language of these people in these meetings, but he's totally making fun of it, you know, because they're they're out there partying. In other words, um, let's let's see if I can pick up a little bit more. He takes these characters, and some of them are the characters writing for the carpet bag, and some are not. Mr. Klump of Franklin wished to know if the agriculturalists of Boston, so highly praised by the gentlemen from Berkshire, were skilled at tillage. Mr. Snooks, which is one of the characters, he may not have been at this point, I'm not sure. Mr. Snooks of Boston was understood to say that they were generally supposed to be perfect in shop tillage. He would add that they were capital at a drain. Mr. Timothy Seed of Barnstable would be glad to learn something more about the science spoken of by his friend from Berkshire. What was the best soil on which to sow wild oats? Was the subsoil plow used? What was the value of return crops? Were there any agricultural fairs in Boston? To what law was this pursuit subject? These were interesting questions. Was the gentleman from Berkshire ready to answer them? Mr. Snook said that the science which the Boston agriculturalists were best up in was, quote, the fancy. They were subject to the higher law, H-Y-E-R law. They were subject to the higher law, in other words. <laughs> and it goes on and on like that. Mr. Green said that he would endeavor to answer the very pertinent queries of his friend from Barnstable. The best soil for the raising of wild oats was that of blind alleys, though, as a general rule, he believed that all the soil within 10 miles of State Street, irrespective of direction, was highly favorable to the growth of this interesting vegetable, as typical Matthew language. It was understood to grow largely in Boston Harbor, from which the inference had been deduced that it was of the same nature as wild rice, an error that could not be too strongly discountenanced. And they go on and on with the puns and the puns and the puns. Let's see. I'll go down to the bottom. Mr. Bumpkin would be pleased to learn what description of animal was most used in the labor requisite to the production of wild oats. The president said that man was the only animal that entered into the business with proper spirit, though, quote, fast crabs had been known to participate in it on occasion. From the fact that the persons engaged in this interesting pursuit were in the habit of, quote, going the whole hog and acting the hog they go, it had been laid down by some incautious writers that the porcine species were a participant with man in it. This was a mistake. The hog, though not remarkable for his proficiency in the graces, was a discreet animal and not given to irregular indulgences. In other words, man's worse than the hogs. 
Mr. Snooks thought the Honorable President mistaken in saying that man was the only animal that entered into the business with a proper zest. The dog was notorious for his attachment to it and for his fondness for the human creatures most eager in its pursuit. The writers on this branch of agricultural science drew some of their most forcible expressions from this known fondness of the dog for the sowing of wild oats. Every man who was most successful in the cultivation of the article was called, quote, a sad dog, and some of the junior cultivators were known as, quote, puppies. <laughs> the Honorable President would surely remember that when a man had gathered in a heavy crop of wild oats, it was custom to say that he had gone to the dogs. The President said he stood corrected soon after this meeting adjourned to assemble again on the next occasion. So there's Matthew's humor. Now, what we need to understand about Matthew is that he hides his feelings under humor. He's a student of Stoic philosophy. When people meet him, they see him as ministerial, and yet he writes this humor. But after Abby died in March of 1841, he was in perpetual grief, rather like Queen Victoria the rest of his life. And we have seen that he would stack his pieces one on top of the other, and that he would very often put a poem above or below a piece like this to show his real feelings underneath. So Matthew would reveal his true feelings with a poem seemingly completely disconnected, you know, by a different person, either by literally a different person or under a different pseudonym, directly above or below his piece to show what he was really feeling. Okay. Now this, this relates to both A Christmas Carol and The Raven, the humor that you see embedded in A Christmas Carol and in the Raven was Matthew Franklin Whittier's humor, not Charles Dickens' humor or Edgar Allan Poe's humor, God forbid, either one. Now, I just, no, I, I didn't just notice this. I'd, I'd seen this one before, another one I just noticed. Directly below this piece is a poem called My Heart's Hope, and it's signed D. Matthew would sometimes bring back his old pseudonyms. This is 1851. In the 1830, 1831, especially, editions of the New York Constellation, which was edited ostensibly by Asa Green, whom Matthew had written for earlier in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, when he ran the Berkshire American, uh, Matthew took over the editing job for that paper, and he signed as D which probably meant either a printer's devil, which he had been uh, previously, you know, a printer's uh, apprentice, or Diogenes, or both. So Matthew has taken his old signature, D, from the constellation from 20 years ago, and he's brought it back for this poem. That means that no one will know that this is him. Uh, not even Schillaber will know that this is him unless he reveals it, but I know it's him. This is called My Heart's Hope. Now keep in mind the whole spirit of the of the piece that came before with the talking about wild oats and the, you know, now he's going to tell you what he really feels about this subject, about love. Her breathing was the rose's breath, her brow the lily pure. She moves as moves the mountain heath when zephyrs charm the hour. Her voice, the whistle of the quail, her eye, the evening star. Around her sighed the summer gale. Birds watched her from afar. Where she came, each tuneful throat poured out its sweetest song. Unless they ceased, intent to note the music of her tongue. And where she stopped, the violets grew. Where looked, the strawberry bloomed. The evening shed its honeydew, the briar was perfumed. And even the sun, as he went down, smiled with his latest ray, as if he fondly loved to crown the sweetest flower of the day. At night, oh, how the stars looked out, a brighter star to see. And how the fireflies glanced about the moonlight of her eye. How nature seemed to pause in awe of its young, blooming queen as from each vale and hill it saw her footstep on the green, signed D. 
Um, there's many references to Abby here. Uh, we know that uh, Matthew signed as a star because Abby loved the stars and thought of herself and Matthew as twin stars. And uh, she loved the songbirds, but she herself had a beautiful singing voice and was a musical prodigy. I've shared all these things in previous entries. If anyone has kept up with these, they will have recognized all those references to Abby. You will see a mention of Abby breaking out into song during their study sessions out in nature in Lady Geraldine's courtship. That poem with, you know, Matthew disguised who she was, and then Elizabeth Barrett Browning went in and customized it for herself. Uh, but that poem is essentially a tribute to their courtship. So that is Matthew's humor and his real feelings underneath. Now we move to the January 31, no, we move to the February 7, 1852 edition. And that's a long time, but he's brought this idea back. He's returned to this idea in the carpet bag. Now, because everybody's forgotten that, that previous one, which was the umpty -umpt meeting. Now this is the Legislative Agricultural Society first meeting. Honorable Mr. Veregreen in the chair, Subject for discussion, small potatoes. Well, Vera Green is one of the characters. I don't think it's Matthew. I thought it was originally, but there are a great many people imitating Matthew's style in this paper. As I said, he set the tone for the humor in this paper, started out writing like six or seven or eight of the pieces in each edition, and then the other writers kind of picked it up and started imitating him. And Benjamin Penhallow Shillaber let them imitate because he wanted all original material, and it's a weekly it's like an eight-page paper, and in order to fill up an eight-page paper every week, he's going to have to let people imitate Matthew because there weren't that many truly original writers in Boston or in the area. Now, already I see something very interesting about this, and that is that right above this piece is a little poem by Carlos, and I've determined that Carlos was almost for sure Matthew. Now, I have to say that this paper gave me a huge headache, especially when I first got hold of it. I got hold of a uh, microfilm copy of this, and I uh, a little, uh, a literal microfilm roll of this paper, and I sent away and had it converted to, uh, I think, PDFs, and uh, I started going through it, and I just had a heck of a time because no sooner would I, I would recognize something as Matthew's style, and then I would continue to read it, and then I'd see some contraindication. Oh, that couldn't be Matthew for this reason or that reason or another reason. See, during this whole period, Matthew is, or most of this period, Matthew is also writing for the Boston Weekly Museum, and during a large part of it, he's traveling overseas. And when he's traveling, in the United States, say in 1851, before he goes over to Europe on July 2nd, I think it was, very often he writes a travelogue, <coughs> excuse me, writes a travelogue as quails, and he often says where he is and, and then gives the date. Therefore, you can check if there's any references in the carpet bag that are topical that have to do with something that happened in Boston, but he's in Vermont at that same day, then it couldn't be him. See, so there's ways to double check and cross reference these things. And I would finally find one of these contraindications and I would say, no, he couldn't be this author. But there was other ones I'd go through and they would correspond exactly with uh, quails, which I'd already definitely positively identified as Matthew. And there were no inconsistencies in the itinerary and there were no inconsistencies where he was overseas. There are a few pieces that appear in the carpet bag when Matthew was overseas. Some of them were left on file for the first few weeks. That's plausible. There were a couple instances where Matthew apparently was in London or even in Paris and was able to mail a packet to the United States. So there's plausible explanations as to how some of that material could have gotten into the carpet bag and still have been Matthew's. I've really been rigorous with this. You know, now there may be holes in my logic. There may be people that come through and poke holes, you know, do the same kind of research I've done and poke holes in it. But I've been really, really careful because, frankly, I don't expect to still be around when people are actually interested enough in this to double check me. See, 
So immediately above this first legislative agricultural society is something called It's Cold. Well, let's read it because this is Matthew's real feelings. And um, what he's going to be talking about in the Legislative Agricultural Society is small potatoes, meaning stuff that doesn't matter. Okay? But let's see what he has to say above this. Oh, how can one be merry, say, and laugh, and sing, and chat, and run on gaily, by the way, and all of that, with the thermometer at zero, and falling, falling fast, he were indeed a very hero, who ever darest to face this winter's piercing cold when Boreas, piping shrill, ruthless creeps through his mantle's fold, his bones to chill. Though one his dearest friend should see, who'd ever think to stop to give his hand a friendly clasp, a word to drop? I sigh for balmy days of spring when gentle zephyrs play, then one can laugh and chat and sing the live long day. Carlos. I think this is a metaphor for Matthew feeling, how can you guys, you know, be frivolous, you know, when Abby is lost, you know. In other words, he's in perpetual grief. And although he covers his real feelings with humor, when he sees, you know, people in grief can't abide frivolity, you know, superficiality. They just can't stand it. They just leave the room. They just stay away from people who are being superficial. And I think that's what this is about. Now, subject for discussion, small potatoes. He starts out, the chair, parentheses, it was a stiff, high-backed, long-armed, and rather uncomfortable piece of furniture, said that he could congratulate gentlemen on the happy circumstances under which they had met. Ostensibly, they had come to Boston for the purpose of attending to public business, but everyone knew that such a notion was all nonsense. They had come here for the purpose of getting their $2 per day and to see the lions, though he was sorry to say that just now there were no lions, Mr. Kimball having found it unsafe to keep them in his famous museum, which rendered their free tickets so handsomely presented by that gentleman of somewhat less value. Besides the objects named, there were others had in view by the gentleman present. They wished to cultivate the acquaintance of the state treasury, to plow the public soil, and to harrow up the feelings of their political opponents. Such were some of the subjects had in view by gentlemen of that society, which he now had in his eye. In other words, they came there basically for fun and politics. Now, Mr. Slow was one of Matthew's characters, and Mr. Slow would uh, sagely teach his son but he was always wrong in everything that he was teaching his son. Okay, so that's that's a that that's another character. Mr. Slow rose to order. Did the chair mean to say that the Legislative Agricultural Society was quote all in his eye? Mr. Snob also rose to order on the supposition that the chair did mean to say that the society was quote all in his eye. Did he mean to make any disrespectable allusion to the lady of the name of Martin? I don't know that reference. The chair had great pleasure in stating that he had only spoken after the manner of the presiding officers of deliberative bodies. He, the chair, had too much respect for the society of which he was the head and the organ to couple it with any female whatever or to make any allusion to Mrs. E. Martin. I don't know who that is. Mr. Heavy Stern said it might be so, and on consideration he was inclined to think it was so. The most remarkable thing about small potatoes was their universality. They were everywhere, and their influence was everywhere felt. It was a mistake to suppose that they were confined to farms. They were to be met with in all places, on all occasions, and under every sort of circumstances. They were to be found at the board of the millionaire, and on the fork of the poor man. They had been seen on board of ships 500 leagues from land. The result, it is presumable, of plowing the sea. Mungo Park had found them in Africa, Ledyard in Asia, and Cook among the cannibals of Oceana. He, Mr. H., had seen them in the White House at Washington, and it was well known that they were the commonest things in the State House at Boston. He had heard of their being in the council chamber. In Congress, they were almost as numerous as the members themselves. Considering, therefore, their universality, he was not prepared to say that the chair was not right in coupling them with political organs, because it went on and on about organs earlier. 
and it goes on like that. You get the you get the gist. Um, he just brings in as many jokes and puns as he possibly can on that subject. Then we move to the last one of the series. This is February 7, 1852. And this is the second agricultural meeting. Subject, what is to be done in order that something may be affected for the benefit of farmers? So uh, the meeting was called to order by Honorable Mr. Muckheap, and on motion of Mr. Snooks of Pumpkinville, Mr. Slow was called to the chair and opened the business by a few observations concerning nothing in particular. Basically, this is about growing cabbage. Cabbage is slang for money, for dollar bills, for paper money. <laughs> Mr. Turnipson of No Town thought the best plan for farmers to follow would be to raise cabbages. The market for the Brassica tribe was considerable in Boston and in Cambridge, Saugus, and other famed depots for Havana cigars, the cabbage was becoming a very important vegetable. Dock leaves were substituted sometimes. I don't know what that reference is. But these did not present a color altogether suited to the finer descriptions of Havanas. Cheroots were generally manufactured from dock, but the price in the market of that variety of cigar would not tolerate the idea of success attending the cultivation of the dock. He would go for the brassica, La Grosse Tambour variety, and no mistake, it was patriotic, it was, and nothing else. Mr. Snooks verily believed that the more of the cabbage was found in the constitution of a man, the greater the respect he bore before society. Men whose heads were filled with brains had no portion of respect compared with those whose heads were filled with the brassica and whose faces were composed of the brass without the ica. And it goes on and on like that. Then there's like there's more about small potatoes. There's uh, there's a report on small potatoes. And there's anti-slavery. Matthew manages to put in anti-slavery uh, sentiments here. Um, and it goes on and on. I won't belabor the point. Immediately after this, and I just picked up on this this morning is a poem by someone named Ellen Louise from Elmwood Cottage, Pomfret, Connecticut. Presumably that's a real person. How Matthew found this poem, I don't know. Uh, I think that she had sent it in. Matthew, again, was involved in the editing of this paper. I think he saw this poem and arranged for it to be put immediately afterwards. So here again, we have Matthew creating a parody of the preoccupation of people with money and making money when he has lost his abbey and what difference does the stupid money make? So immediately after this about small potatoes and cabbage, he puts this poem, My Gentle Love. The wind sweeps through the sycamores and plays the same old tune and still as then the dew gems gleam beneath the glinting moon and still thick stars are glancing from out to the welkin bright, and still the star she called her own shines forth with purest light. And evening bells are sounding as holy, soft, and clear as when they rang the vesper this very night last year. But every tone seems wailing, and earth with gloom o'erspread. I'm not what I was yesterday, my gentle love is dead. Ah, me, I am not dreaming. This very night last year they folded up my loved one and sadly laid her here, and coldly earth is pressing upon her brow so fair, and darkling shades are settling upon her golden hair. I know not what fiend brought me this weary night down here. For sure I am they buried my love this night last year. But still I seem to see her. Her blue eyes are as bright as when beneath the star beams we murmured our troth plight. And I won't read all of this. You see very clearly that in this one also, the, uh, the woman is identified with stars and a particular star she called her own. Well, this was a convention, I think, in Victorian times, but Matthew makes sure that when he has something that represents Abby, that 
that, that, that love of the stars and identification with a star is represented, if at all possible. It, it means it's what draw, drew him to the poem. So here again, we have someone who's, uh, who's grieving and they just can't abide. It's, it's like what you see with people who've had near-death experiences. Their complete value system has changed. And this is true in grieving persons as well. Suddenly, all the things they thought were important are just nothing. You know, the, the, the frivolous talk, the sowing of wild oats, the uh, partying, the uh, seeking after money, all the frivolous stuff is nothing. And then he puts what's, what's real, what really matters immediately after these. So Matthew always had a deeper message, almost always had some deeper message because he was a deeper person and there wasn't really a market for that. And he didn't want to come out and risk himself at that level. So he would, he would uh, stay behind a veil when he expressed his deeper insights and his deeper feelings, a veil of humor, a veil of a uh, pseudonym, you know, a veil of juxtaposing pieces like this, even if it was someone else's work. And you'll see this in the famous ones as well, the ones that were stolen and became famous and made somebody else famous. You'll see the exact same characteristics in those also. Even in The Raven, you know, he's hiding some of the torture that he's experiencing in, in humor and the cleverness of the plot and so on. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I, I mean, I feel like the guy that, that uh, threw a party and nobody came or the guy that opened a fancy restaurant and, and there were no patrons because they all went to the hot dog stand or the, you know, greasy spoon next door instead of to his restaurant. Um, and I just keep the restaurant open. You know, this is like somebody that's spending his last savings to keep the restaurant open, even though hardly anybody is coming through the doors, you know, and somehow or other, I need to pass it along to somebody else when I pass on so that it's there in the future and it's still open when people grow up a little bit and realize that I was right. I wasn't really scary. I wasn't wrong. I wasn't delusional. I was actually right. I made an incredible discovery. And this, this material is well worth spending time with, you know, and you really can't understand these famous classics so long as you attribute them to these plagiarists. You can't really understand the depth of the Raven if you think that it's written by the sociopath Edgar Allan Poe as a gothic imaginative poem, horror poem. You can't really understand the depth of A Christmas Carol, although some people do just straight from the heart, you know, but you can't really understand it if you think that Charles Dickens, the man who was cruel to his wife and plagiarized all kinds of people and plagiarized one of his illustrators who then committed suicide and Dickens had visited with him the night before and apparently didn't express any remorse about it. <laughs> this guy couldn't have written A Christmas Carol and you can't understand A Christmas Carol so long as you think that that guy wrote it and so on with the other things. You can't really understand the depth and, and power and philosophy behind Matthew's reviews for the dial, signing F, or his uh, star-signed reviews and essays in the New York Daily Tribune from fall of 1844 to mid-1846, if you think that Margaret Fuller, the egotist, wrote those, you know, because the writer of those pieces was not an egotist. He was a deeply spiritual person. And Margaret Fuller, despite being amongst the transcendentalists, simply was not. So I continue to keep the restaurant open. Uh, I continue to give away free samples like I'm doing now, uh, day after day, um, in my somewhat amateurish way of presenting them, you know, the best I can, because I'm not a TV host, you know. And uh, three people come to avail themselves of the, of the uh, free samples from the restaurant, 
four people, seven people, sometimes as many as 15 people, if they think that I've presented some kind of evidence that bears on a Christmas carol or the raven, they might, 15 might show up, probably to try to disprove me, you know. Um, it's a sad business, you know, and I do get depressed about it, but I'm dedicated to God. I dedicate everything I do to God and to my guru. And so, therefore, that saves me because there are people who have made incredible discoveries who are never appreciated by the world, and eventually they kill themselves or something, you know, or destroy themselves one way or another because they just can't handle it. I can handle it because I dedicate everything as a steward, you know, to God. So I can handle my restaurant only being visited by two or three people, you know, um, I know of other examples of people who have done exceptional work and they're not nearly as much appreciated as they should be. I, over the years, I've showcased a few of them, uh, especially in the music that I've chosen to attach to my written blogs. Uh, Chris Dedrick of the Free Design is one of them. He's passed on now. Eric Johnson, the guitarist, is another. Eric Johnson is very much appreciated for his technique by guitarists. He's also a mystic. And he hides his mystical depth very much as Matthew did. Uh, it's clearly in his songs. Um, for example, on the album Europe Live, and I think in some earlier ones, there's a song called Last House on the Block. And it sounds as though he's leaving a house, you know. Well, it's a metaphor. It's about reincarnation, which he does believe in because it's in the liner notes of one of his early albums. Um, it's about hoping that this is his last physical lifetime on earth. And he comes to the conclusion at the end that no matter what he does by his own efforts, he is not able to do that to achieve mukti, but that there is a value and a charm in the relationship with God, even if you're not able to do that on your own steam. See? Can you imagine? That's the real message in that song. And how many people picked up on that. What percentage? Half a percent of the people who appreciate that song for, you know, its vis visceral pleasure and its artistry and technique, maybe half of a percent understood that. And it's really obvious if you know what you're looking for. There's no question. I'm not reading that into it. It's obvious. Um, I have tried to get uh, Eric Johnson interested in being interviewed, you know, by myself about metaphysics. And I've, I think I got one response the first time I queried and the manager said that he preferred not to or something like that. You know, he keeps it very quiet. Um, and they're not the only two. There are others like that that are doing excellent work. I would call it genius level work, but by genius, I don't mean what most people mean. I don't mean that you have a very fast processor and a lot of RAM and, you know, a lot of memory, big hard drive. You know, I mean ins that you're inspired. I mean that you're able to act as a conduit for higher uh, levels of consciousness. This work that Matthew did was inspired work. What I'm doing now is inspired work. Uh, Eric Johnson's music is inspired work, and so was Chris Dedrick's. Uh, it may be that it takes one to know one. I don't know. I'm not bragging. This is just a statement of fact. People who have not yet tuned in to that level, they can't really recognize it, and they can't discern it from people who are imitating it. There's a lot of imitators. Matthew had a lot of imitators. In this carpet bag, he had a whole bunch of imitators, but they didn't really have his spirit, his inspiration. And uh, as a result, I think that he was he was kind of silenced or forced out of the paper toward the end. Maybe maybe the money that he had donated ran out, you know, and he lost his influence. I don't know. But uh, toward the end, the imitate, imitators kind of took over. For example, I'm going to go get this real quick. And I'm basically not worried about going long now. I really don't care. <laughs> you know, like I said, the heck with that. Um, let me reduce this a little bit, just a little the carpet bag as a full-sized weekly like this folded after its second year. These things ran from spring to spring. 
So it folded after its second year. But to try to save it, it went to a pocket monthly. Well, there's one of them. It took me years to find these. Uh, that's what it looks like on one side. That's what it looks like on the other side. The pocket carpet bag. And there were a few of these that came out. The very last one was the holiday edition of 1853, which I don't have. There's only one copy in existence that I know of. It's in the American Antiquarian Society. I'll put uh, some pictures of it up here. The back cover is missing and it's shorter, so some, some of it may have been taken out. I don't know whether there was more material in it. But the only thing in it that's left in there is the Christmas story that Abby wrote that uh, Matthew had caused to be published in the full-sized edition. It came, it was a Christmas story, but it didn't get in there until January 1st, January, uh, I don't know what it is, the first 1853 edition, uh, unsigned. It's definitely Abby's. And it appears in the pocket carpet bag, the very last one. So Matthew sort of got the last word. The very first edition of the carpet bag is all dedicated to Abby in one way or another. It includes a story about a family called the Wagtails, which was co-authored by Matthew and Abby, I'm quite certain, just as A Christmas Carol was co-authored by them, and Chanticleer was also co-authored by them, which I've shared recently. Uh, it contains a few other things that are Matthew's. Basically, the whole front page and what follows on the next couple pages of the very first edition were all Matthew's contribution to that paper, which probably partly reflects the fact that he put a lot of money into this thing. See, and this is, this is 1851. In 1850, Matthew had published a book, and I'll go ahead and get that right now, get your copy for that. This book is called The Mistake of a Lifetime, or The Robber of the Rhine Valley. It was published in serial form. It's signed Waldo Howard, published in 1850 by Frederick Gleason, who owned Gleason's Pictorial and also the Flag of Our Union. It's a long story. This is Matthew Franklin Whittier. I can prove it. I got a nice smoking gun in this regard because Matthew protested the critics in the language that he used when he first started writing as Joe Strickland. <laughs> and it's clearly him. So I've got four copies of this book. It's, a, it's an excellent novel. He pulled out all the stops. It's, it's beautifully written, a uh, very intricate plot. And he made a lot of money. He got $3,000 up front. Probably some of that went to an agent because I don't think Frederick's, Frederick Gleason ever knew that it was his book. I think he used an agent. So the agent negotiated $3,000, which was a lot of money back then, plus royalties. Um, and he had also published Chanticleer, apparently. So he had a lot of money. That's how he invested in the carpet bag. He sunk all that money, basically, into the carpet bag and lost it. This is what the mistake of a lifetime looked like in serial form. I think this is like the second one. Um, this is precious stuff, let me tell you. Not easy to find. What I read for you recently, the story of Ever Everard and Fidelia, the last blog entry, that was uh, kind of a precursor to his writing in The Mistake of a Lifetime, except The Mistake of a Lifetime is much more sophisticated, I would have to say, and not so uh, black and white, you know, in the old Victorian style, it's more sophisticated. Well, anyway, the point I was getting to with the carpet bag is there is absolutely nothing of Matthew Franklin Whittier's work in either of these first two editions of the pocket carpet bag. He had become dissociated from the paper by that time. And I think that's why the paper folded. Officially, the reason is given that uh, it was too edgy. Well, that was Matthew, you know, because he was writing for this conservative editor, but he managed to get this uh, very edgy, radical work in between the lines, you know. Uh, and certain people were offended, but I think the real 
uh, end of the paper came when they kicked Matthew out because the imitators just didn't have it. They didn't have the kind of inspiration that Matthew had. So, I mean, Matthew was able to write a book that became a bestseller and earned him $3,000 in 1850 money and never became famous for it because nobody ever knew that he was the author, you know. This is who we're dealing with. We're dealing with somebody that avoided fame like the plague. But unfortunately, the problem with that, and this was Abby's philosophy, I think, but the problem with that is that people would steal it. Not only would they imitate it, but he, they would actually steal his work, and he wouldn't come out and defend it. This is what happened with, I mean, A Christmas Carol was a matter of Matthew handing it over to Dickens, but being fooled by Dickens and taken advantage of. Like I say, it's like uh, somebody taking candy from a baby, basically. And uh, The Raven was an out-and-out theft, where uh, Edgar Allan Poe, having a copy of it that Matthew had shared with him back in the first half of 1842, apparently, seeing it, uh, seeing that it was coming up in American Review, because he was a critic and he could get advanced copies, seeing it was coming up, he rapidly convinced his editor at the uh, New York Evening Mayor to publish it under his own name, to scoop the one that was coming up in American Review by a couple days. That's how that one went down. Margaret Fuller, her situation apparently was that uh, the rumor developed you know, that because she was the literary editor of the New York Tribune, that she must be the writer of the star. And she gradually began to, quote unquote, admit that she was the star. She had admitted it early on in private correspondence with her aunt when her aunt asked her if she was the star. And she said yes. But here it was like the public was clamoring to know who is the star writer? Is it Margaret Fuller, the literary editor? And she says, oh, yes, it was me. You know, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Apparently, Matthew and Abby, it's a long story, and I'm going to go into that in my paper, but they must have sent her a poem that they wrote about their son, Joseph, uh, when he was a baby, before he died in August of 1838. She reworked it and published it in Finden's Tableau. Let me go get that for you. This is Finden's Tableau, and... The very first poem in the entire piece is called A Dream. And that was Matthew and Abby's poem about their little son, Joseph. I've gone into this in a paper that I will publish later on this year, hopefully, or early next year. And I think I can very gently show this to you. Uh, there it is. That's the illustration that went with it. The very first cover of the book, then comes the title page, then comes this poem, the dream. And then she reworked it again from the original, not from this, but near as I can tell, and somebody can uh, dispute with me on that. She reworked it back from Matthew and Abby's original when she published her compilation of poems in 1844, and there it's called A Child Asleep. If you can discern, as I can, what's the real, original, mystical writing and the pretend, phony mystical writing that Elizabeth Barrett, the future Elizabeth Barrett Browning, used to indulge in, you can see that there's some of the real stuff in the first one here in the tableau, and there's some of it in the second one in the poems compilation in 1844. So she went back to Matthew and Abby's original, reworked it again, and published it as a child asleep. Then there were three other poems that Matthew must have sent her in 1842 when he was shopping his stuff around to various literati and showing his unpublished work to people, <coughs> including Edgar Allan Poe and Elizabeth Barrett, and many other people who probably were honorable and would never think of stealing his poetry, see? So I don't know. I don't know what else to say, and I don't really know how to wrap this up. We're right at about an hour. Again, at this point right now, I don't care. I would rather be surprised if anybody uh, in this current time 
gets to the end here and hears this. <laughs> so I don't know. I know I'm doing excellent work. Uh, I know I'm doing inspired work like Eric Johnson and Chris Dedrick. And I think that cream will rise to the top because the power that's inherent in inspired work lives on. It's even there when plagiarists distort it. There's enough power in a Christmas carol to still affect people, you know, deeply touch them, those who are receptive. There's enough power in the raven even though they think it was written by the sociopathic fool and imposter, Edgar Allan Poe. He was, he was clever, but he wasn't deep. <laughs> you know? Anytime Poe looks deep, it's because either he's imitating or he's plagiarized. He was just clever. And he wasn't that clever. He was kind of childish in his cleverness. Uh, I don't know. It, you know, sometimes I think there's certain things that are just meant to be hidden forever, but I don't believe that. What I believe is the truth will out and that anything that has power, real power from inspired levels of reality will sooner or later have to manifest. This is what Abby tells me. It has to manifest. It can't not manifest. So I believe that my work will somehow or other manifest both my past life work and my present efforts. And it's just a matter of time and uh, how it's going to be preserved at this point, I don't know. <laughs>